All right, hey guys, welcome to Through the Bible, Verse by Verse, a plain and simple study of the entire Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse. We're currently in Numbers chapter 7. And, um, you know, the first, Exodus, actually Exodus, um, um, and Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, they can be quite tedious. Um, one, they don't really apply to us today. They do not apply to us as non-Jews. There are some moral things we could take. And I want to say that one of the things we could get, we, we, we learn, even though we're not under the Old Testament law, and, and, and meaning this, we're not, we don't go by, like, the, as we're going through, we're studying this, from our perspective, this is mostly historical as we're looking at this. And what we kind of glean from this is, I think the best lesson is, we know we know from a moral perspective how God thinks about certain things. We also have to be careful that, in thinking about this, remember, this is what God was telling the Israelites. And he wasn't telling us, he was telling the Israelites. He wasn't commanding us. So, 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 for example, the Nazarite vow that we studied in the last chapter. Well, that has nothing to do with us at all. And, and it also has nothing to do with when you make a vow to God, whether or not you should make a vow to God. That, that's my point. So we have to be careful about that. It was what God required Israelite men to to do when they made vows, okay? So this is why I'm kind of glancing through some of the more uh, meticulous and tedious parts because again, they really just don't, you know, they don't apply to us. <clears throat> I'm giving you the gist, these are offerings, these are the procedures of offerings, who were to make the offerings, who were to carry out certain commands. And that, and so we can, from a historical standpoint, we're getting a look behind that. <coughs> and some of this, too, uh, uh, when it comes to the priest duties, remember, not even all of the Israelites maybe might not have gotten that because these were for the priests. So, in other words, if you were just a, a regular person, you came to, um, you, you would know what to bring as an offering and what to do. You know, here, priest, you know, then the priest would take it from there. All right, so chapter 7, Numbers chapter 7, and it says, On the day Moses uh, finished setting up the tabernacle. Now, uh, remember um, the timeline overlaps when we end it with, um, in, the, in the book of Exodus, he had finished the, the erecting of the tabernacle, Leviticus, remember the entire book of Leviticus was the handbook, the giving of the instructions of how the, the, the Levites were to care for the tabernacle. Uh, and then um, now, um, but this is the same timeline. Remember, he completed the tabernacle. So they uh, after the third month, if we go back to Exodus, after the third month, Israel came out of Egypt. God had begun to give instructions on what the tabernacle would be. They begin to assemble. And then we see that they begin to not only then gather the materials, they begin to make and construct the materials. So by the end of Exodus, this was the the the, the the ending of the first year going into the second year. So this is where he's saying it right here. This is numbers is picking up at the end of the second year. The, the tabernacle is uh, finished. And uh, so this is what, what Mo, he is saying here on the day, verse seven, I mean, chapter one, verse, I mean, chapter seven, verse one again. On the day Moses finished setting up the tabernacle, he anointed the and it consecrated it and all its furnished along with the altars and all of its utensils. And after he anointed and consecrated these things, 
Now, let me also do one other thing. The, the, the term anointed in anointing here, um, a lot of charismatics use the word anointed. And they misuse the word. So, for example, they, they will refer to their gifts as anointings. Like, I have the anointing uh, of a prophet. I have an anointing of a pastor. And that's kind of a misuse of the term. Um, as you see by here, when, when it says that Moses, when Moses anointed, at the same word, after he anointed, well, it, it, it was really a marking of sorts. This is how they would anoint it. They would pour oil over it. How they would anoint a king or a prophet. They would pour oil over his head, symbolizing God's covering over that person or thing. Okay? In the New Testament, how charismatics and Pentecostal use the word anointing, and they use it for terms of gifts or and calling. So they would say, well, I have the anointing of healing. Well, what they really are referring to is grace. That God is grace, or God has given me the grace. And we can basically just say that God has given me the power. That's all. God has given me the power to do something. He's That gift uh, of whatever calling it is, that's what they mean. So here we can see, an, again, a very good definition of anointing. After he anointed and consecrated things, verse 2, then the leaders of the Israel, the heads of the ancestral house, presented an offering. They were the tribal leaders who supervised the registry. Okay, and uh, they were they were there, um, and they brought as their offering before the Lord six covered carts and twelve oxen, a cart from every two liters and an ox from each one, and presented them in front of the tabernacles. It says, verse 4, And the Lord said to Moses, Accept these from them to be used in the work of the tent of the meeting, and give this offering to the Levites, to each division, according to their service. Now, I'm just going to gloss over because this is a long chapter, as, you, as we will see. It says, And Moses took the cart and the ox and gave them to the Levites. And it says he gave to the Gershonites, and then what they, what they gave. Um, and then it says the leaders, in verse 10, the leaders presented, uh, dedicated uh, gifts for the altar of the anointing then the one who presented him offering the first day so this is this is going to be a 12 day kind of ritual that they do for this kind of inauguration of the tabernacle so again on the first day then this is what Nishan son of Aminadad and then uh, on the second day verse 18 Nathan the son of um, Zer and this is what his offering was uh, verse 24 on the third day uh, Elibab son of Helan whoever these people are right on the fourth day uh, Elijah son of uh, Shidiar right and it talks about his offering what he gave and then um, on the fifth day uh, Shilmiel son of Zerai whatever his name is and it talks about the offering which he gave on the sixth day um, and then notice this on the seventh day and then on the eighth day on the ninth day on the tenth day and then on the eleventh day and then it said on the twelfth day um, and then all of the, what they offered and what they gave uh, verse uh, 84 this was the dedication gifts from the leaders of Israel for the altar when they were when it was anointed, and then it talks about all of what they gave, 12 dishes, basins, bowls, um, the weight of each one, the pounds, uh, and again, bowls, rams, male, bulls, all of the gifts that these leaders gave. And then it said that when Moses entered the tent of the meeting to speak with the Lord, he heard the voice speaking to him from above the mercy seat that was on the ark of the testimonies from between the two cherubims, he spoke to him in that way. All right, so let's go to chapter 8. Um, it says, verse 8, I mean, uh, verse 1, chapter 8, verse 1, <clears throat> Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Speak to Aaron and tell 
him when you set up the lamps the seven uh, lamps ought to give light in front of the lamp stand so Aaron did this he set up the lamps to give light in front of the lamp stands just as the Lord had commanded him uh, and then it, it goes on to how the lamp stands were made verse 5 the Lord spoke to Moses take the Levites from among the Israelites and ceremonial cleanse them this is what you must do to them for their purification sprinkle them with the purify pur, with purif, with the purification water and have them shave their entire bodies and wash their clothes and so purify themselves now they were to shave and and some of them of course were very hairy if you had hair on your chest back legs whatever he said they were to shave their entire bible so i mean bodies okay uh then it talks about different uh, offerings, bulls, and all that. Um, verse 13, you are to have the Levites stand before Aaron and his sons, and you are to present them before the Lord as a pre, uh, presentation offering. And then in this way, you are to separate the Levites from the rest of the Israelites so that the Levites will belong to me. So this was called the inauguration, the actual inauguration of the Levite, the tribe of Levite from everyone else. Only the Levites could offer, uh, minister in the holy things of the, the priesthood, the tabernacle, and worship. So, uh, um, verse 17, For every firstborn among the Israelites is mine, both man and animal. I consecrated them to myself on that, on the day I struck down every firstborn in the land of Egypt. But I have taken the Levites in place of every firstborn among the Israelites. We talked about that uh, in the last, a couple of chapters ago. Um, verse 19, from, um, from the Israelites, I have given the Levites, Levites exclusively to Aaron and to his son to perform the work for the Israelites at the tent of the meeting to make atonement on their behalf so that no plague will come against the Israelites when they approach the sanctuary. In other words, remember, the Levites were to be the helpers to Aaron, his son, the high priest. Um, Moses and Aaron, verse 20, and the entire Israelite community did this to the Levites. They did everything to the the Lord. He commanded Moses regarding the Levites. The Levites purified themselves and washed their clothes, and Aaron presented them before the Lord at the presentation offering. Um, Aaron also made atonement for them and ceremonially cleansed them. Verse 23, um, then the Lord spoke to Moses in regard to the Levites from 25 years old or more. A man enters the service <clears throat> in the work of the tent of the meeting, but at 50 years old, he is to retire from his service in the work and no longer serve. He may assist his brothers to fulfill responsibility at the tent of the meeting, but he must not do the work. This is how you are to deal with the Levites regarding their duties. So they were to serve from 25 years old to 50 and then retire. Now this retirement, they lived also on the property in the land that the Levites had received. Remember they had lands spread throughout Israel and, and um, they had lands and also they were to be taken care of um, by Israelites from the gifts and the offerings. Um, okay, verse 9. I want to start this. I'll see if I can finish it with in, in this study. And then, But it says, verse 9, In the first month of the second year after their departure from the land of Israel, the Lord told Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, the Israelites are to observe the Passover at its appointed time. You must observe it at this uh, at its appointed time on the 14th day of this month at twilight you are to observe it according to all the statutes and ordinances so Moses told the Israelites to observe the Passover <coughs> and remember the Passover was started on the day that Israel um, exited or exited um, the Egypt and they have uh, verse 5 and they have to observe it in the first month and the 14th day at twilight in the wilderness of Sinai. The Israelites, the Israelites did everything as the Lord had commanded Moses. But there were some 
But there were some men who were unclean because of a human corpse, so they could not observe the Passover on that day. These men came before Moses and Aaron the same day and said, We are unclean because of human corpse. Why should we be excluded from presenting the Lord's offering at his appointed time with the other Israelites? Moses replied, Wait here until I hear what the Lord commands for you. <clears throat> now we're going to see these kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, questions come up from time to time, and then Moses is going to say, Wait here, and then God is going to instruct them. Verse 9. Now, remember, we saw this about the guy who was working on the Sabbath day, and they said, Put him in custody or in jail. And the Lord said, Up, oh, he's to be stoned. So, good and bad, this, this, this process is going to happen while Moses was with them. <clears throat> Verse 9, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Tell the Israelites, When any of, when anyone, any of you <clears throat> or your descendants is unclean because of a corpse or is on a distant journey, <clears throat> he may still observe the Passover to the Lord. Such a person are to observe it in the second month on the 14th day of the twilight. They are to eat it. They are to eat the animals with unleavened bread with bitter herbs they are to they may not leave it until the morning or break any of its bones they must observe the Passover according to all their statutes <clears throat> now this is interesting here and uh, just a sidebar <laughs> note because I deal with black Hebrew Israelites and all that and I, and I asked them do you keep the, the Passover and they will always say well we can't because we're not in Israel well, obviously they haven't read all of the law because here he just said, even if you're on a journey, you still can observe the Passover. All right. So verse 13, but the man who was ceremonially unclean is not is not on a journey and yet fails to observe the Passover to be cut off from his people because he did not present the Lord's offering at his appointed time uh, that he that he may bear his consequences of his sin. So. Even if you're on a journey, you still can observe the Passover. If you're ceremonial unclean, you still can do it. You just can do it in the camp or among the people. Verse 14. <clears throat> if a foreigner resides with you and wants to observe the Passover to the Lord, he is to do so according to the Passover statute and its, uh, and its ordinance. And you are to apply the same statute both to the foreigner resident and the native of the land. So again, those who are not Israel, if they're living there, were to abide by the statue on the day <clears throat> on the day the tabernacle was set up the cloud covered the tabernacle the tent of testimony and it appeared like fire above the tabernacle from evening until morning it remained that way continuously the cloud would cover it appearing like a fire at night and whenever the cloud was lifted <clears throat> above the tent the Israelites would set out at a place where the cloud stopped there the Israelite camp. At the Lord's command, the Israelites set out. At the Lord's command, they camped. As long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they camped. Even when the cloud stayed over the tabernacle many days, the Israelites carried out the Lord's requirements and did not set out. Sometimes the Lord remained over the tabernacle only a few days, and they would camp at the Lord's command and set out at the Lord's command. Sometimes the cloud <clears throat> would remain uh, only until evening morning and the cloud would lift in the morning they set out or if they remain day and night they moved out when the cloud lifted <coughs> excuse me when whether it was two days or a month or longer the Israelites camped and did not set out as long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle but when it was lifted they set out they camped at the Lord's command and they set out at the Lord's command they carried out the Lord's requirement according to to his commands through Moses. Now this was kind of astounding to me because this cloud stayed with them during the wilderness journeys. Um, this cloud was with them. It was again a huge cloud and, and you remember when Pharaoh tried to follow them the cloud moved in back of the camp and blocked Pharaoh and them from passing through, which to me, those dummies should have said, you know what, we better turn around. But they kept there all night. During the day, it was a cloud, and at night, it looked like a pillar of fire. No other nation had this miraculous sign 
present with them for 40 years, signifying that they were serving the one and true God. No other pagan gods had this. This is amazing. All right, guys, we're going to pick it up in chapters um, 8 um, um, in the next uh, in the next study. All right, guys, I'll see you then.